Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Welcome to Misty Mysteries, a true crime and paranormal podcast. I'm your host, Keely, and this is the first episode of November. For November, I'm going to be taking a special interest in true crime. This means that there will be three true crime episodes this month, taking a break for Thanksgiving week here in America so I can focus on spending some time with family. I am choosing to focus on unsolved cases where law enforcement's actions or the justice system may have failed the victims, leaving their families searching for answers or having to fight the system themselves. I have covered cases in the past such as Keisha Jacobs, Sean Doherty, and Amber Tuckero that have covered these type of topics, but I want to take a special interest in it for November. Now with this in mind, I want to talk about the homicide of a young girl named Tyra Marie Garcia. A month back, I reached out to Tyra's sister, Tanya, who allowed me to share Tyra's story with you today. Tanya and the Garcia family's victim advocate and host of No Activity podcast, Maria, shared with me some personal stories about Tyra, as well as details and resources that helped me put together the episode for you. Hey there, it's Audrey, producer at Spike and Crown Studios. Now's your chance to support a 3D animated horror film and get some awesome rewards in return. Check out spikeandcrown.com and visit our Kickstarter to make a pledge. You'll get our cutest dog, Sancho, the heroic basset hound, in full plush form. He's super cuddly, has a magnet nose, and comes with a real pet collar. Best of all, you can get producer credit, limited edition trading pins, digital collectibles, and much, much more. Check us out at spikeandcrown.com. That's S-P-I-K-E-A-N-D-C-R-O-W-N. There's a link at the top so you can visit our Kickstarter page, watch the trailer, claim these amazing rewards, and become a horror film producer. Isn't that cool? Once again, it's spikeandcrown.com, and we're live on Kickstarter. Tanya's first message to me was about her goal when sharing Tyra's case. And I want to read that message to you so you understand what her family is fighting for. My goal when talking about Tyra's case is to mention how she was a child with special needs. Tyra was learning disabled and was in special education. She disappeared and the authorities refused to look for her. I feel California's laws and laws all over the country need to change when dealing with children and special needs children. She also wants to help keep the memory of Tyra alive. Let's get into a little bit of who Tyra was. She was born on February 12, 1970 in Ventura, California to her parents, Margaret and Ron. She was the fifth born out of six children. She had two older brothers and two older sisters, including Tanya, and one younger brother. I was able to ask Tanya about Tyra, and she described her as outgoing, energetic, sweet, and loving. She made friends easily, but never wanted to go anywhere alone. Tyra liked to be out of the house doing things, and she was overall fun to be with. She loved skating at a place called Skating Plus, bowling at Bueno Lanes, swimming at the beach, and sunbathing. She loved to go bike riding, camping, and went to amusement parks. She would spend time with her family at the drive-in. Her mom was a big scary movie fan and she passed that love to her children. Tyra really enjoyed movies like Indiana Jones, Exorcist, Gremlin, Sixteen Candles, Footloose, Grease, Poltergeist, and that's just to name a few of them. She also enjoyed going to concerts and loved a variety of music. Her sister even joked that she liked country music even if she denied it. Tyra really seemed like she was just a normal teenager, especially one living in a small town, which today Venture definitely is not a small town, but in the 70s it was. She always had something to do, somewhere to be, friends to be with, and family who loved her. Although, for Tyra, some of her friends were not always the best influences on her. When Tyra was in 6th grade, her parents ended up getting a divorce, and divorce at any age can really be hard on children, but especially at such an awkward time of your life. To add on to such a hard situation, Tyra's father married a new woman, and his new wife was not a huge fan of the children and didn't really want them around. This marriage really affected his relationship with Tyra and her siblings. 
Tyra struggled with her parents' divorce and the changes that divorce brought on. She and her siblings were left to deal with adult problems while still children themselves, such as financial changes and their mother struggling with depression while trying to adjust to being a single mother. This took a toll on Tyra, especially her performance in school, on top of any struggles she may have already had since she did have an IEP. In the 8th grade, she met a group of friends who had a pretty negative influence on her. Tanya described Tyra as a follower when it came to her friends. These friends would get Tyra into a lot of trouble involving partying and drugs. There was one night in particular where the trouble she got into with these friends caused a medical emergency for Tyra. But before I get too much into that, I want to talk about an ex-boyfriend of Tyra's that she met around this time. At just 12 years old, she met a boyfriend who was a year older than her. He started off very nice to Tyra and her family. Margaret, being the sweet woman and mother she was, accepted this boyfriend and took him into her home, treating him like he was one of her own children. Soon, he started to begin to show his true colors. He was very possessive over Tyra, telling her that if he couldn't have her, then no one could. He then became physically abusive, leading to a day where Tanya got in a fight with him to protect Tyra. He was kicked out of the house, but he and Tyra were together for two years. This was still a pretty scary and awful night for the family, linking back to where we left off with her friends. On Tanya's 16th birthday, Tyra had come home complaining that her veins were burning and she seemed overall unwell. She was taken to get medical care by her mother, where it was determined that she was suffering from an overdose of an unknown substance. Tyra was sent to get inpatient treatment, and when she got back home, she had a new attitude. She wanted to get back on track with school, and she wanted to get a job. Most of all, she wanted to find someone nice who treated her like she deserved, so she ended up leaving this boyfriend, making it clear that she didn't want him around. Tyra also began counseling with her family, where it came out that while with this particular group of friends, these friends would inject her with drugs. See, Tyra had a phobia of needles. She would have never injected herself, and her family has made it very clear that she was never struggling with a drug addiction. This only happened when she was with this group of friends, which ended after this scary emergency. At this point, Tyra would still go out late with different friends, but her mom always knew where she was. Tyra wasn't one to let her worry, which is why when she went missing on May 27th, 1985, her mother knew something was wrong. May 27th was Memorial Day, and it started out just like a normal day. She woke up and watched TV with her siblings. She ate breakfast, hung out with some friends, till they left for her older sister's Memorial Day dinner around 1.30 p.m. that day. There, they spent their time eating, watching TV, and playing games together, and got back home to their apartment in Ventura at 10 that night. They all went into the apartment and got ready for bed when Tyra started to make calls to friends. She was trying to get someone to come with her to go see one of her other friends about a babysitting job for that next weekend. When her friends told her it was too late and she should wait till the next day, she asked Tanya to go with her who told her she couldn't because it was just late and she was tired. She wanted to finish her laundry and go to bed. Tyra asked her mom if she could go ask about the job and her mom reminded her that she had a very busy day that next day. She had school, and after school, she was starting a new job. Tyra told her mom she knew she had a busy day, but she needed to go for just a few minutes, telling her, I'll be right back. Tanya felt this was a bad idea. She had an awful feeling that if Tyra walked out the door, she would never see her again. She told her mom to say no, but she told Tyra to go and come right back. Don't play any games, just come right back home. Tyra got dressed in her black spaghetti strap top, blue jeans, and an elastic black belt with a metal hook. She also wore black Chinese baby doll shoes with red soles, but she didn't wear a sweater that night even though it was cold and she didn't bring her purse with her. Her purse was on her bed. At 11 p.m., Margaret and Tanya gave Tyra a hug and a kiss goodbye even though Tanya still hadn't shaken that feeling that something wasn't right and they watched Tyra walk down the street into the apartment building where her friend lived. This was the last time they would see Tyra. The next time Tyra was seen was just outside her apartment in the alley behind it. The alley was shared with the apartments, a 7-Eleven, and a strip mall. Tyra was sitting on the stairs of the 7-Eleven at 12 a.m. that night. When the neighbors saw her from her window, 
The neighbor yelled to Tyra that it was getting late and she needed to be home. But Tyra told the neighbor it was okay, she was just waiting for someone. The neighbor saw a Chevy Monte Carlo pull up to Tyra. It was a light brown, tannish color lowrider with two men in it. Tyra leaned into the car to talk to the men. She then waved goodbye to her neighbor and got in the car. Tyra was then seen with these men inside a 7-Eleven at 12.30 a.m. by the cashier getting drinks and snacks. She didn't seem to be scared of these men and it seemed to the cashier and the neighbor like she knew them. Her family has also said multiple times that she would have never gotten into a car with anyone she did not know. At 1 a.m. that night, there was a party happening at a local motel. The motel has changed its name over time, but at that point, it was called Loops Motel. This party was happening in multiple rooms of the motel and had a lot of people coming and going, including friends and family of Tyra. Multiple people who knew Tyra reported seeing her at the party, but no one reported seeing her leave. At this point, I want to let you know, the police have made mistakes or really a lack of effort in Tyra's case. And one of the things was locking down a timeline for Tyra's night. At this point in time, there was no confirmation she was at this party by law enforcement. They have even said that there was no party that night, that it was a calm, quiet night. We also do not know who she was with at this party, if she was at the party, and if she was with the men she met up with at 7-Eleven. Since these men have never been identified, although there is a description of the men she was with, these men were both described as young Hispanic men in their 20s or 30s. One was short and heavy set with acne scars, and the other was tall and thin. The taller one has also been described as possibly being Caucasian. Tyra's family remembers seeing a composite sketch of these men. Her grandmother even gave her mother a copy, which sadly they can't find since the passing of Margaret in 2018. Tanya has reached out to the police for a copy of these composites, but she was told that these composites do not exist, which is honestly so frustrating. Something else that is frustrating is the first interaction the family had with the police. This interaction happened on May 28th, the next day. That next day on May 28th, Tanya woke up and saw Tyra's bed hadn't been slept in and she knew something wasn't right. She searched for Tyra that day with no sign of her. When Tanya returned home, she told her mom that she needed to report Tyra missing. When Margaret called the Ventura police to report Tyra missing, she was told that they couldn't take a missing persons report because she was a runaway. She was told with no evidence that Tyra was a runaway and law enforcement never took any time to come and speak with the family. She was simply told to call back after 48 hours of no communication from 15-year-old Tyra. I want to talk about runaways and missing children for a moment because this is something that we have touched on a few times, but I feel it's an important topic. Tyra was marked a runaway in 1985 and her family was told to wait 48 hours, which today is not protocol for minors who have run away. Even adults you believe may be missing. You do not need to wait 24 to 48 hours, but there are still issues with law enforcement system around runaways. Today, they are treated and marked as missing children, but they are not searched for like children they feel aren't runaways. I have seen many people talk about this, but the term runaways has many negative ideas behind it. And even if a child chooses to leave home, they are still in danger. The world is dangerous for any child on their own if they choose to leave or not. Especially when you consider that runaways are very easy targets for sex trafficking, drug abuse, and violent crimes. To add to this, children of color are more likely to be marked as runaways and to receive less media attention than missing Caucasian children. Runaways is generally a term I feel like should be phased out for the best. And though Tyra wasn't a runaway, she definitely fell victim to not only an awful crime but the failure of justice runaways receive from law enforcement. This failure of justice is honestly something Tyra and her family experienced fully from that first call on the 28th leading all the way to today. At this point in the story, I'm going to take a pause to let you know I've been experiencing a storm here in California for the last two days, but I'm going to keep continuing. So the first time this happened in person for the Garcia family was on May 30th, 1985. 
When this day rolled around and there was no communication from Tyra or information on where she could be, Margaret decided to go down to the Ventura Police Department to report Tyra missing. When she asked the officer who took the report what was going to be done to help find Tyra, she was told that they weren't going to do anything because Tyra was a runaway in their eyes. The Ventura Police conducted no search parties, put out no missing person flyers for Tyra, It was up to her family completely to search for her. They printed out flyers, putting them up all over Ventura and the neighboring cities. Then, friends and family went door to door, searching for her and sharing her information. During the 10 days that Tyra was missing, her aunt was having dreams that she was dead and so was Tanya. Tanya was having dreams where Tyra would be looking at her smiling and she would hear her voice, even if she wasn't speaking, telling her that she was okay and not to worry. But the worst wasn't confirmed until June 7th, 1985. At 1.30 p.m. on June 7th, the body of 15-year-old Tyra Garcia was found in an orange grove in a desolate area of Moore Park, California. Initially, Tyra wasn't able to be identified. She had been wrapped so tightly in a blanket and left in a sunny spot. The investigators told the newspaper that day they had no missing persons reports nearby, which is farther from the truth. And instead of reaching out to Tyra's family, Tyra's aunt was the first person in the family to see that a body had been found. And knowing that Tyra was still missing, she talked to Margaret about going down to the coroner's office. They both went together to the coroner's office, but only Margaret was allowed in to talk to the coroner. Sadly, due to how Tyra was left after her death, the decomposition was just too far to allow Margaret to see her. Instead, the coroner had to ask Margaret if she had anything she could identify that Tyra was wearing. She told them what Tyra was wearing that night. She went missing, including the jewelry she knew she had on. The coroner then brought out the jewelry she had been wearing wrapped in a towel. Margaret was able to identify Tyra's golden cross necklace she always wore, a rose ring she bought her for her most recent birthday, and another ring. She also had two rubber bracelets. When Margaret confirmed that this was Tyra's jewelry, the coroner put the jewelry in a jar with rubbing alcohol. The coroner then asked about the clothes she was wearing when Margaret last saw her, which matched what she was found in. Margaret left that day with Tyra's jewelry in a bag. When she got home, she put this jewelry in a box and left it untouched for a long time. The next day was when the remains were officially confirmed as Tyra through dental records. And this was about the only testing that was ever done. When the autopsy was performed, they did no nail scrapings or sample collection from the nails, combing of her hair, combing or testing on her clothes for hair or DNA. No rape kit was done. Her mouth was never swabbed. No testing on the maggots found on the scene. And a toxicology was never done. Her cause of death and time of death were never found due to the state of decomposition. In fact, when Tanya requested the autopsy and the coroner's notes for Tyra years later, there was only two pages for the autopsy and three for the coroner notes. The autopsy notes didn't even have her height, weight, or color of hair. Two pages for an autopsy don't sit right, and a normal autopsy notes for a homicide are average 30 pages. The police also never preserved the scene where Tyra was found or submitted anything to the crime labs. The Ventura police only investigated for three days before closing Tyra's case. In those three days, they went in and out of the apartment, collecting items from Tyra's room she shared with Tanya. They also interviewed Tyra's ex-boyfriend at the dining room table of the apartment and interviewed a few of her friends, but they never interviewed any of Tyra's family before closing this case. There was even a mistake on Tyra's original death certificate. As many of you know, funerals are expensive, especially burials, which is important for the Garcia family, being part of the Catholic Church. When news of Tyra's death broke to the community, they all came together to bring food and help show love to her family. They even gathered up some money to help pay for the funeral, but it wasn't enough. Margaret reached out to the organization that helped families of homicide victims pay for funerals, but they needed to see Tyra's death certificate. Unknown to her family, her death certificate marked her death as a suicide, which prevented the organization from helping them pay for the funeral. Margaret was later able to get her death certificate fixed. Tyra's aunt took them to a conference for family members of homicide victims, where she met Dory Tate, 
the mother of Sharon Tate, who was one of the victims of the Manson family murders, along with her unborn son and a few of her friends. Dory heard about Tyra and listened to Margaret about what was happening. When she heard about the mistake on the death certificate, Dory went down to the coroner's office herself to get Tyra's death certificate changed to say unknown homicide. Unfortunately, Tyra still had to be cremated, but she was laid to rest in the Ivy Lawn Memorial Park on June 12th after a funeral fit for who she was. She was surrounded by so many family members and friends that some who attended the funeral had to wait outside during the service. Even with this big funeral, with the police closing her case after only three days, by June 15th, it felt like everyone had gone quiet about the crimes committed against Tyra. This has never stopped her family from fighting for her and the justice she deserves. They continue to pass out flyers, asking for any information on Tyra's death. Today, Tanya works hard alongside the family's advocate, Maria, to keep her face and story out there on social media. Maria also hosts the No Activity podcast, as mentioned earlier, which deep dives into the life and death of Tyra, which I highly recommend you check out. They have also pushed to get her case reopened, which was successful in November of 2021. But it wasn't until this year they were able to get the investigator to submit any evidence that police did have to the crime lab. Although they were told the crime lab is backed up and the investigator wasn't sure when evidence in Tyra's case will be tested. Her family has never stopped investigating on their own. They even turned to a medium. They went to a psychic fair in Ventura after Tyra was found. Tanya, Margaret, and Tyra's aunt went to the fair together. Margaret carried a notebook with a picture of Tyra in it. They found themselves drawn to one particular woman. This woman asked them not to say why they were there. She wrote in the notebook, and she was accurate with what she wrote. She gave the description of the car and the two men that picked Tyra up. She told them where Tyra was found and how she died. She gave them information that only the investigators knew. And she told them that the family knew Tyra's killer and were close to him, but that he did not do this alone. Her mom took this information to the investigators, but it hasn't helped to get any closer to catching who hurt Tyra. In order to bring Tyra justice, people need to talk because someone knows something, and unfortunately there are a lot of people around them that refuse to talk. Maybe out of fear of getting in trouble for something else, or knowing they played a part in her death. On the No Activity podcast, Maria shared that if whoever may be listening knows something and they're afraid that they may get in trouble, it's been 37 years now, and most crimes have a statute of limitations. If you know something and you think you will be in trouble, know that the only person who will be in trouble here is the person or people who played a part in her death. Speaking up will help bring justice to Tyra and closure for her family, which they deserve after 37 years. There are rumors of theories around Tyra's death. Some believe that her ex-boyfriend may be responsible because of his behaviors, not only before but after her death as well. If you remember, he was not the nicest guy. He was very abusive towards her. And when she ended it, she made it clear she did not want him around. After this breakup, she ended up meeting a guy she really liked and treated her nicely. At the time of her death, they had been going out for eight months. But when she went missing, her ex-boyfriend showed up at the apartment talking about Tyra and concerned about her. He ended up staying at the apartment, which is why the police interviewed him there, and he stayed around till after the funeral, even going to her funeral trying to be in all of the family's conversations while her current boyfriend was there. Others have pointed at a friend of Tyra's, this friend acted weird at the funeral as well towards her father Ron, and at points after her death with other family members, including Tanya. While theories of her possibly being a victim of a serial killer, especially with so many active serial killers in California in that time, have been shared as well. The current investigator on Tyra's case has brushed all these off and marked her death as an accidental overdose. But Tyra was not using drugs at the time of her death, and no toxicology was done to either prove this point or eliminate it. At the end of the day, no matter what happened, someone somewhere knows something about what happened to Tyra. She deserves justice. She didn't wrap herself in a blanket, and she didn't drive herself to that orange grove. If you have any information, you can submit a tip to noactivitypodcast at gmail.com, or you can reach out to Ventura County Investigator at 805-384-4736. You can also submit a tip to the tip line at 1-800-222-TIPS, that's T-I-P-S, and I will also have the website for this tip line in the episode notes.
I'm going to end this week's episode in a way I don't often end these cases, mostly out of respect. Tanya shared with me that the family started to experience paranormal activity after Tyra went missing. I shared a little bit of these experiences with the dreams, but she did tell me some more experiences and gave me permission to share with all of you. Starting when Tyra went missing, her family could smell her perfume and cigarette smoke. They could hear someone walking around upstairs when they would all be downstairs. They could hear what sounded like the bikes crashing, but when they checked, the bikes would be where they were and fine. Their dining room felt really cold and eerie. They even saw shadows moving in the house, which they never saw before Tyra's death. Margaret would hear Tyra's voice. Tanya and RJ, RJ is their little brother, also slept with their mother for months out of fear of paranormal activity. On one occasion, Tanya saw someone run up the stairs. When she went to investigate, she could smell Tyra's perfume, and she saw a cloud of smoke. Afraid of what she saw, she ran downstairs, where she was scared out of the house by a big gush of wind coming from upstairs. This activity doled down as the years went on, but it never fully stopped when they moved out in 1991. She does wonder if Tyra could be attached to the house or if she is still there today. In any case like this, especially with how young little Tyra was, I hope that she could have moved on to whatever is next for all of us. At this point, I want to thank you for listening to this episode. If you are listening and you know a missing person or an unsolved case that you feel needs attention, please feel free to reach out to me on social media or email the podcast, which I will have the podcast email in the episode notes. If you like the podcast, you can always help out by sharing and leaving a review. Please stay safe and I will see you on the next episode.